Hello everyone and welcome to another News Coulomb video and another plug side chat. I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, Bjorn Nieland. He's a Tesla Bjorn as a lot of people uh, know him. His thousand kilometer challenges that he does uh, out in Europe testing electric vehicles and seeing how fast he can travel a thousand kilometers, which is about 621 miles. Uh, he wants to see how fast he can travel in those electric vehicles, basically the shortest uh, amount of time. Uh, possible. So if you're like me, uh, you, you watch a lot of those videos. They're very entertaining uh, and, they're, and they're fairly informative. However, I do have some issues with what Bjorn does and how he tests and I think it could have some negative impacts on electric vehicles, but uh, I also don't think that the tests ne necessarily represent everybody, right, who uh, would buy an electric vehicle or how they would plan or intend to drive it. So one of the things is Bjorn drives really fast uh, and I mean easily 75 to 85 miles an hour uh, but I think it's safe to say you know that he drives much faster than the average person would drive and there are valid reasons for driving that fast because over the course of 621 miles every five miles an hour faster that you drive uh, represents about 30 minutes of time savings. Now, some of that is offset with additional uh, time spent charging, but it more than compensates for that additional time. So something like a Bolt EV, right, going 75 miles an hour instead of 70 miles an hour, you're only looking at maybe another five minutes of charging per stop on average. Uh, so that 30 minutes you save is a significant improvement. But, you know, there are diminishing returns and I think that's something that needs to be acknowledged. Uh, one of the vehicles that Bjorn tested was the uh, uh, Zoe uh, ZE50, right? And that car in, you know, winter conditions driving 80 miles an hour, it only charges at 45 kilowatts. So you hit this point of diminishing returns where you're actually hurting your trip time because you know your charging time is more than compensating now for that maybe 30 minutes of extra time that you saved by going 80 instead of 75 miles an hour. Uh, something like the Bolt EV, right? I know that that uh, diminishing returns appears to happen about 77 miles an hour. I say that because if you track based on efficiency uh, how long it would take you to drive versus charge at 75 miles an hour versus 80 miles an hour, they're almost the identical time, right? So somewhere in between there is actually uh, sort of that sweet spot where you can match your maximum charging speed to your maximum driving speed and achieve your fastest trip times. Now, outside of those diminishing returns, I, I do have one other concern with the way that Bjorn does his testing, and, and that is really, it is about the legality of it, right? And not only that, uh, putting electric vehicles on a different uh, footing than if you're testing against gas-powered cars. Because essentially, what he's attempting to do is replicate as fast of a trip as you could get in a gas car, but in an electric vehicle. And I think that could be detrimental to electric vehicle adoption. And the reason I say that is it doesn't matter what you do. Electric vehicles are not right now capable of traveling as fast as any average uh, gas powered car. And I know this based on my own experiences with my Chevy Volt, right? It has the internal combustion uh, generator backup. And on that regular 500 mile trip I make, it's super easy for me to average 65 miles an hour uh, without really ever breaking the speed limit. And that includes a meal stop, a fuel stop, a bathroom break, and 65 mile an hour average uh, travel speed, that's really hard to achieve. It's, it's basically the upper limits of what you could hope for in a Tesla Model 3 long range rear wheel drive, uh, which is, basically the most efficient and fastest traveling electric vehicle you can get at this point. And so in order to replicate those times in that Tesla Model 3, I would need to be driving 15 or 20 miles an hour over the posted speed limit for a lot of that trip, uh, just in order to match the speeds that I was seeing in my Chevy Volt. And then on top of that, you know, in my Volt, I can maybe make one bathroom break and a meal and fuel stop 
and in the Tesla Model 3 in order to achieve that 64, 65 mile an hour average travel time, I would need to stop multiple times, but none of those stops would be long enough to be convenient. So when Bjorn tested the uh, Tesla Model 3 SR Plus on his 1000 kilometer challenge, it ended up taking him something like seven stops in order to drive 621 miles. That's a lot of stops. Now they were all averaging maybe 15 to 20 minutes per stop, but I think that's one of the big barriers right now uh, to electric vehicle adoption is the average consumer isn't going to want to make that many stops. Most people would rather make fewer stops but have them be more convenient. So instead of making three fast stops at chargers that they don't want to stop at, they would make one stop at a location where they would want to stop. And that's, I think, one of those perceived and validly perceived uh, issues with electric vehicle adoption right now. And I think it's something that we do need to acknowledge. Right now, what you see is with internal combustion engine vehicle owners, when they take a trip, they adjust their driving to match the expectations of the trip. Whereas right now with electric vehicle owners, you're having to adjust your trip to compensate for the shortcomings or capabilities of the electric vehicle and like I said that is a big problem and it's actually something that I think thousand kilometer speed tests uh, doesn't really fully address right now I appreciate his tests because one thing that they do is they shatter that narrative that in order to travel in an electric vehicle you need to drive slowly. No, electric vehicles are the same as gas cars. If you want to increase your travel speeds or if you want to shorten your travel times, you increase your speed. It works the same way as an ICE car, as an internal combustion car in that regard. However, uh, there are more significant compromises and again, that's only one way of traveling. You know, an alternative way of traveling is to make fewer stops uh, for longer periods of time. And it's one thing I don't think Bjorn's testing model accounts for is that additional stops take more time. Now, in Europe, a lot of the charging stations and a lot of the fueling stops are located a little bit differently than they are in the United States, so it's more convenient. It's more like a turnout or a uh, rest area stop than it is in the United States where you have a more of a formal exit off-ramp and on-ramp, uh, but each stop here, I can assure you, takes a minimum of five to 10 minutes per stop just getting to the fueling point and getting back on the freeway. Doesn't matter if you're talking about a gas-powered car or an electric car, there's a cost to additional stops. So going back to Bjorn's uh, SR Plus uh, test, those seven stops that he made, uh, outside of the charging, outside of everything else, they likely added close to an hour to his overall trip time by making those additional stops. And if you can make fewer stops, even if you're charging slower, you can actually offset some of that time. So now my reason for bringing this up is I should be getting a 2020 Chevy Bolt EV tomorrow, basically, and I'll have it for not quite a week for testing and evaluation purposes. But one of the things that I do want to do with it is a thousand kilometer challenge, but uh, it's really the 621 uh, mile challenge that I'd be doing. And, you know, I'm not trying to steal Bjorn's thunder with this. One, I already asked Bjorn if he would test the Ampera E in Europe. That's basically the European uh, Bolt EV. And he wasn't really interested in testing it, which is fine. Uh, and I mean, I understand it. It's not really something that's actually actively being sold in Europe at this point. So he probably should be focusing more on the models that are going to be available in Europe. Um, but, I, I wanted to at least give the Bolt EV its day in the sun and uh, you know he's not going to have access to a 2020 Bolt EV to test anyway. Now again part of the problem is I'm not comfortable driving in excess of the speed limit the way that Bjorn does uh, so I've had to identify a sort of unique separate route where I would be able to drive approximately uh, the same speeds that Bjorn drives but legally. Now. And this is part of the reason I want to do this. I'm going to set up a poll. I'll share it with uh, the community on YouTube. But I want to know from you, uh, I, I'm 
leaning toward driving just the posted speed limit. Now, understanding that it's actually going to add time to the trip uh, where the car would normally be able to travel faster. So, uh, but even still the route that I've chosen, the average driving speed without traffic should be about 73 miles an hour if I'm going the exact posted speed limit. Now the other options are maybe a 5% rule or 10% rule where you go five or 10% faster than the posted speed limit or even the five mile an hour rule. So it's 70 mile an hour posted, I might be driving 75 miles an hour. Uh, and really for my personal comfort level, that is sort of the cutoff. It's either the 5% or five mile an hour rule. I don't like to go faster than that unless the flow of traffic is, is basically demanding it. Uh, but I'm gonna put it out to the community to find out. And I do wanna say one other uh, reason for choosing the exact posted speed limit is if I do future tests, it will create something of a control to assure that we're testing other vehicles in the same way um, and putting everything on, on balanced footing. And then again, if you are one of those people who does drive five or 10 miles an hour faster than the posted speed limit, it gives you uh, sort of a baseline to then calculate what maybe you could expect in your travel times if you were to increase the speed. Uh, I, I was going to initially do this trip with my 2017 Bolt EV, uh, but with, you know, know, six to eight percent battery degradation. I, I feel like it's maybe more valid for a brand new car with a brand new battery, but if there's interest, I can always go back and test my own car on the same route uh, again, right? And uh, we could see how well it does. Maybe there's a, a valid reason to, to see how a Bolt EV holds up after 100,000 miles. And for those of you who followed my channel, I mean, you, you've seen me on my 500 mile trips, I can regularly maintain between 50 and 55 miles an hour in my 2017 Chevy Bolt EV. And that's with 10 to 15% of the driving uh, being at posted 55 mile an hour or slower speed limits. Uh, and so I've never really actually been able to fully see uh, the fastest trip times I can actually uh, maintain with this car. Even with those 45 kilowatt chargers, the 2017 uh, Chevy Bolt EV can maintain uh, around a 50 mile an hour average trip speed. So uh, if you look at Bjorn's videos, uh, you'll, you'll see that that actually compares very well with a lot of the cars he's tested. Uh, so anyway, I'd love to hear from you. I, I'd love to hear what you think about this test, uh, what you want me to do with it, whether you want me to do, go exactly the posted speed limit. Uh, and, and the you know community will ultimately, I think, influence how I decide to do this test. But I hope it's interesting. I hope you find it useful. Uh, so look forward to that. And uh, yeah, and I should be uh, recording and posting the video in the coming days, but I think it's going to be an interesting test and maybe a counter perspective uh, to the way that Bjorn travels and the way he's testing his uh, EVs. Uh, and like I said, if there's more interest in it, uh, just as an alternative, another data point, again, not to steal Bjorn's thunder, but just to give an alternative to how it's tested. Uh, again, I'd love to hear from you and I uh, look forward to seeing how you vote in the community poll. And uh, as always, thank you for watching.